What a privilege to carry Oh, everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often fall 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Yeah. The sun comes up.
It is my joy to honor you. Amazing love, oh, oh, oh. amazing love. How can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Father, we want to thank you for your love this morning. We want to thank you that you sent your only son, no greater love than that to redeem us. Father, we thank you for the power of redeeming grace. We thank you that faith worketh by love. So, Father, we ask that this week you show us a new dimension of love so faith can explode. Father, we thank you for our, uh, how you are preparing a way for us, a way that we've not walked before. And, Lord, we are excited that you love us and you'll hold our hand to walk us through it. Father, I ask for the body of Christ today that they see the best in each other father I ask that there be a major shift through the body that they start seeing the best that you have father open our eyes to that in Jesus name praise him all you see
are those in my body, those who are called to be my bride. The enemy has held you captive under a vision of a false identity of who you think you are, what you think you know about me and that which I have called you to do, that which is called pride and false humility. This day I am breaking that off of you, for I have created you to be my living temples, the tabernacle where the living spirit of the Most High dwells, that place where my revelation is poured out and poured through. So I say, I am building you up fresh. I am building you up and strengthening you new. Now let's sing this one more time. Amen. Good morning. And happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. And those, those of you who are not fathers, you have a happy day too. And welcome to the Triumphant Faith Institute. This is, uh, we, move it, we move it around from time to time just to see if you're paying attention. Right now we're on Sunday mornings. But, uh, and right now we're in a new module called the Worship Module. I, I taught one, Chuck taught one last week, and this is my second one in the Worship Module. Because God wants to bring His church to a new place of worship. The worship of the past was good, but there's still more we can get. There's further that we can go. God wants us to ascend in worship to experience His goodness and His blessing in our lives. And so He wants us, during this module, <clears throat> to get a better understanding of what worship is and how we enter into it. So this morning, this is Worship Module Part 2, The Danger of Idolatry or... Breaking God's Cycle of Blessing. You know, in this module we're looking at one of the most important elements in our walk with God, and that's worship. But what is worship? You know, worship is not just going to church. A lot of people say, oh, I'm going to go to church and worship. No matter what goes on there, they think going to church means you're worshiping. Worship is not just singing some songs. It's not just repeating some ritual. Worship is your heart's response to the goodness of God in your life. When God blesses you, there needs to be a response. Worship is, first of all, it's acknowledging God's true value to you. It's an expression of His worth to you. The word worship, worship actually was originally spelled worthship, because that's what it's about. It's saying, Lord, you are so valuable to me. You mean so much to me. It's acknowledging that God is worthy. The angels around the throne continually say, Worthy, oh, worthy are you, Lord. The word worthy means of great worth. So how can we show God his worthship? Well, last week we compared it to a good marriage. How does a husband show his wife that she is valuable to him? Well, he gives her gifts. They celebrate their special times. They express his, he expresses his appreciation verbally. He says, I love you. He gives her compliments. He responds when she comes into the room. When a husband does those things for his wife, he's demonstrating her worthship. 
She is valuable to him. And see, those are the very same ways we demonstrate God's worship. God is looking for an indication of his worth to you. One way you show him that is giving to him. Giving is an act of worship. Celebrating special times with him. When we celebrate the feasts, we celebrate Shabbat. Those are times God says he wants to meet with us. And celebrating those is an act of worship. We express our appreciation verbally to him. We praise him. We tell him that we love him. We respond to his presence. We clap our hands. We raise our hands. We dance. We rejoice. Those are ways to demonstrate God's worship. Look at some of the words the Bible uses to describe worship. Worship is acknowledging the Lord. It's saying, Lord, I recognize that you are the source of every blessing in my life. Worship is magnifying the Lord. It's expressing how great our God is. Worship is boasting in the Lord. It's openly exalting His greatness. Worship is a response. It's a response to experiencing God's goodness. So if God has done something for you, you owe him a response. If he has saved you, you should worship him. If he has healed you, you should worship him. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you should overflow with worship to him. If you've received revelation from God, you should worship him. When God blesses you, he deserves your worship. Last week we looked at Luke 17 also. There, ten lepers call out to Jesus for healing. He said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were healed. And one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. That's worship. But Jesus had an interesting response to that. He said, were there not ten healed? Where are the other nine? He's saying, I'm happy to heal you, but I was expecting a response. When God does something great for you and there is no response of worship, that means there's something wrong. Worship is a response to God's blessing, but worship also brings more blessing. I love God's promise in Exodus 23, worship the Lord your God. And his blessing will be on your food and your water. He will take sickness away from among you. None will miscarry or be barren in your land. He will give you a full lifespan. He will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. He will establish your borders. And see, that was God's original plan for mankind. He wants to bless you and he wants you to respond with worship. God's plan for humanity was that God would dwell with us in perfect, unbroken fellowship. And as we walk with Him, He pours out His blessing to us, meeting our every need. And our response is to be thankful, giving our worship to Him. And that's what God said He wanted back in Deuteronomy 28, 47. His will for His people was that they would worship the Lord their God with joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. And so that was to become a perpetual cycle. God pours out blessing. We give him our worship. God receives our worship. God pours out more blessing. Tell your neighbor, I, 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 want, to, I want to be in that cycle. But sometimes that cycle is broken. Sometimes God pours out his blessing, but there is no response of worship. Instead of worshiping God, his people give their worship to another. That's called idolatry. You see, you will worship something. You were created to worship. You are a worshiper. And if you do not choose to worship God, you will find something else to worship. God gave Israel great blessing. He delivered them from their bondage and slavery in Egypt. Brought them out with great signs and wonders. But instead of worshiping him, they made a golden calf. 
They gave their love to a man-made idol instead of the God that rescued them. You see, you will worship something. Some people make a carved image. That's definitely an idol. But there's other kinds of idols. Some worship money. Some trust in it. They devote themselves to it. They give their lives for it. The object of your worship can be a person. It can be a rock star. It can be a hobby. It can be a sport. It can be a brand of computer. But you were made to be a worshiper. It's inside of you and you will worship something. And that thing that you worship is what you're passionate about. It's what you love to think about. You love to talk about. You want to get other people to appreciate it the way you do. You devote your time and your resources to it. You know, the Bible exhorts us to worship God passionately with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To worship Him with freedom. To praise God openly and expressively without restraint. But see, religious spirits have caused many Christians to believe a lie. Many Christians have been told something like this, you know, God is very old, and He doesn't like loud noises. So when you go to church, you need to come in and sit there quietly. See, they don't think it's right to get excited about God. They don't feel free to express their praise and their worship to God. And yet down inside them, there is something crying out for worship. And so if they can't come to church and worship God, they'll find something else to worship. So they come home from church and they head out to the football game. And at the game, they get excited. They raise their hands. They jump up and down. They wave flags and banners. They do all of those things they don't think are appropriate to do in church. They have passion. They boast about their team. They shout as loud as they can. Now, it's not wrong to get excited watching a football game. But it is wrong if you can't get even more excited about the the God who created you. Now, you need to hear that. It's a first fruit principle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get that excited there if you give God your best before that. So if you can't give God your best, don't give it somewhere else. Mm, Amen. See, if you don't worship God, something else will take God's place. And the result is idolatry. If what you are most passionate about is not God, that means you've got an idol. And idolatry brings problems. See, God hates idolatry. Idolatry causes God's presence to leave. In Ezekiel 8, we talked about that last time, that it's the, it, the presence of God visibly departed from the temple because Jerusalem had become filled with idolatry. The God who created you, who redeemed you, and who blesses you deserves your worship. And when you take that worship that belongs to Him and give it to another... It's like a wife who is unfaithful to her husband. As a matter of fact, God gave us a book in the Bible to show us how he feels about idolatry. And it's the book of Hosea. Hosea is one of the greatest love stories in history. And it's a picture of God's love relationship with his unfaithful people. Because Hosea lived at a time when Israel was enjoying great prosperity. They had received the blessing of God... But they had turned from worshiping God to worshiping idols. And so God raised up Hosea to speak to his unfaithful nation. And he told Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer. And their marriage would be a living demonstration of God's love for his idolatrous people. Hosea married Gomer. He showered her with love. He brought her into his home. They lived together as husband and wife. But Gomer was not a faithful wife. When Gomer gave birth to her second child, Hosea suspected that he was not the child's father. And by the time their third child was born, Gomer's infidelity was so obvious, Hosea named the child Lo-Ami, which means not my own. 
Yet even though Hosea knew Gomer was unfaithful, he still loved her. But the day came when Gomer grew weary of the pretense of being Hosea's wife. So she deserted Hosea and moved in with one of her lovers. But even after Gomer left, Hosea kept watch over her. When he learned that her new lover was not able to provide her with her basic needs like food and clothing, he began to send her anonymous gifts. He gave her grain, new wine and oil, silver and gold, wool and fine linen. But she continued to give herself to her new lover, never suspecting where the gifts had come from. It was a vivid picture of Israel enjoying all the blessings God was giving, but giving their worship to an idol. Finally, in Hosea 2, Hosea decides to cut off the gifts. He said, I will take away my grain, my new wine. I will take away my wool and my linen. Now, Hosea was not doing that to be vindictive. He was doing that in hopes of restoration. In the Voice Bible, it says, once she has nothing, I will be able to get through to her. I will lead her into the wilderness where we can be alone. And I will speak to her heart. And I'll win her back. See, God had shown Hosea that Gomer had, come, had to come to the end of herself be short before she would respond to him. Just as God was going to have to let Israel be defeated and carried off into captivity in Babylon, so Hosea was to allow Gomer to face loss and have nothing. So as Hosea withdrew his hand of blessing, things began to go downhill for Gomer. Without Hosea's gifts, her new lover could not afford a live-in girlfriend. So he grew angrier and more abusive every day. As the months passed, Gomer was mistreated, malnourished. She lived in fear for her safety, but the nightmare was just beginning. One day, the man attacked Gomer, beat her, bound her hands, drug her down to the local slave market, and sold her into slavery. Chained to an auction block in the filthy slave market, Gomer knew her life was over. Her future could hold nothing but shame and abuse and degradation. In the ancient world, when slaves were put up for auction, they were stripped of everything and displayed naked before the bidders. And so standing on that auction block, Gomer literally had nothing. She had no money, no possessions, not a shred of clothing to cover her shame. She had no rights, no dignity, no hope, no dream, and no future. Gomer had come to the end of herself. And then to make matters worse, she looked out at the crowd of leering bidders and she saw Hosea, the husband she had abandoned. And he was there and he was looking at her and he was bidding for her. Her humiliation was now complete. Gomer thought she knew what, his, what her future would hold and it terrified her. But then something happened she had not anticipated. Because see, God had a plan for Gomer. God had sent Hosea to bid on Gomer and pay her purchase price. So Hosea bid more for Gomer than anyone else was willing to pay. And he won the auction. And then Hosea looked at Gomer in her shame and humiliation. And he said gently, I love you, Gomer. And I've paid the price to set you free. Come home with me now and be my wife. Hosea had said, once she has nothing, I'll be able to get through to her. I'll speak right to her heart. I'll win her back. And that's exactly what happened. With her covenant renewed, Hosea restored to Gomer everything she had lost. Her possessions, her home, her children, her future, and her dignity. He gave her back the silver and the gold, the vineyards, the grain, the new wine, and the oil. But more than that, her life became a living testimony of God's grace and covenant love. And see, that's a picture of how God deals with his people when they worship idols. Idolatry is spiritual unfaithfulness. It's receiving the blessings of God, but withholding the love he deserves in return. And so there comes a point where God withholds his blessing, hoping that we will return to him. 
That's why when you don't give God the worship he deserves, you always find yourself ending up in barrenness and desolation. Idolatry brings desolation. But God is not withholding blessing to be vindictive. He's holding it in hopes of winning you back. And see, the good news is when we finally turn back to him, when we begin to worship him as he deserves, then the blessings return. The cycle of blessing is restored. That's what God promises in the last part of Hosea, in Hosea chapter 6. God says, if you will acknowledge him, if you'll worship him and him alone, the blessings will return. He says, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. And as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that refresh the earth. See, even though Israel went through great distress, God's plan was not to harm them. God's plan was to bring them out of idolatry and call them back to true worship. And when they finally did that, the result was great blessing. God restored the fullness of his blessing, the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and the overflowing joy of Holy Spirit. And see, that is still God's desire for his people. So this morning, ask God to show you if you have any idols in your life. I think for some of you, God's already done that. As we've gone through this, there's something inside that said, Oh, I think I have an idol. And if God shows you that you have an idol, I have good news for you. You can repent. You can be restored. And then you can choose to worship. Because worship is the key to God's blessing. When you choose to worship, even when things look the darkest, that is when the greatest blessings come. So it's time to seek the Lord with all your heart. It's time to acknowledge Him. It's time to be passionate about God. It's time to magnify the Lord. It's time to boast in the Lord and enter his cycle of blessing because God has a hope and a future for you. Let's stand up and lift our hands. Lord, we thank you that you are leading us into a new level of worship that brings a new level of blessing. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's clap our hands for a moment. Now, if you would, before we take our break, we've got a little time. Turn with me to uh, Exodus 32. And Linda, I want you to come up and share one more time your dream on the golden calf. Uh, I, I, think, I think we're a little uh, deceived in how... We, the enemy can deceive us very easily in this worship dimension. And we lose sight of what we're called to do. So I want to point out a couple of things to add to this. So I'm hoping you're getting this on the uh, teaching as well. One of the things we'll be doing, we'll go, we'll go back and we'll compile these teachings into certain formats that you can get. And then we will really uh, align, have a way for you to align with us so we really know that you're getting this. So I'm going to ask Linda to share. This is the month about the golden calf. So we want to understand worship. And as I said earlier, it's not the problem of a football game. There's no problem there as long as you have given God your best and entered into the first fruit anointing. Therefore, you've already expressed your greatest to him, and, and that's very important. Now, Linda's going to share this, and there's certain words she's going to use I want you to hear. In my dream, um, I looked down, and in the calf of my leg, there was a gold chain, and it wasn't just on my leg, it was in. It was like embedded it had begun to grow into 
my leg and I couldn't get it out. And I saw that if I, if I tried to pull this thing out, it was, it was just going to create a big gash in my leg. So point number one, in your walk, there are things that you're recognizing, but you don't have any faith to figure out how to remove them. And I think that is really the compassion we have to have for people. They're walking in a way, they realize they've got something wrong in their walk, they realize they can actually see that there's something wrong in their walk, but they have no idea on how to remove that. Well, that, that was the whole dream, but I kept pondering it. I knew it was a dream from the Lord, and I could not understand what it meant. So I went to check. And your statement to me was? I had this dream and I had the chain embedded in my calf and I don't know what it means. See, I think, I think that's in a nutshell where um, I look at the body and I don't see them the way that they're just trying to be filled with idolatry. I see that they actually can see something's not right, but they don't know what to do. So I looked at Linda and I said, well, it's very obvious. It's a golden calf. And she said, well, it wasn't obvious to me. No. And I, I really think that's our problem. And uh, I, I don't think God is allowing us to break into a new dimension because we're not helping each other. In other words, I could have looked at Linda's leg and said, well, you, you're in idolatry and you've got a, uh, you're worshiping something wrong. Therefore, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You go figure this out where I said, okay, let's see what it is you are most idolatrous over and that you're putting in front of God. And what it ended up being was the church. See, and therefore what you want to see with a lot of idolatry, religious spirits actually are what's deceiving us from seeing it. And I want us this month to, to get delivered of some things that we know that's not right. And even though right now we don't know how to get delivered of them, there is a way of deliverance. There is a path of deliverance. The one thing that was real key to me was um, I was extremely offended when Chuck said that to me, that he would say that I was in idolatry or that I had an idol. Um, and so uh, I had to get over my pride and I had to get over the offense to allow the Lord to speak to me. The other thing I saw in it was I was very protective of my idol and because I really felt like that was what I should be doing. That was right, that I, was, I had the right perspective, I was devoted in the right way, and uh, I didn't want anyone touching that. And so I had to really allow the Lord to show me where where things were off base with that, but uh, I think that's one key to recognizing an idol in your life is uh, if if someone you trust prophetically and you trust authoritatively says you've got a problem here and something rises up in you and says uh uh no that is not the problem then it's probably an idol. <clears throat> It's probably an idol. And uh, uh, Robert used to say when people would come, see, they would want Robert to counsel them, and they would say, don't let Chuck know I have this problem. <laughs> and he would say that was the first indicator they really had a big demon. <laughs> and uh, here's, our, now let's look at Exodus 32. Let's thank God for Linda. Now, I want to give you a perspective of this golden calf that's a little different because I don't think they were just trying to 
get away from God. I don't think that's what was going on here, and I don't hear this talked very often like this. What I think was the real problem here was they entered into a spirit of abandonment and said, we have to do something. And that's what happens with us. The same thing that happened to Saul. The golden calf and Saul are the same thing, where, where Samuel told Saul to wait and he wouldn't wait. And so what happened was Moses, who had been leading them, now wasn't present with them. So something activated in them, and they said, we have to do something. Now, that's another way that you see that you have an idol. You believe you have to do something. So what they actually didn't wait upon was Torah. And that's the problem where idolatry is going to come in. They couldn't wait for Moses, the authority structure that was leading them, to bring down the statues that would help them set their boundaries for their future. Therefore, they set it themselves. Now, as long as you're getting that, when you decide to do something with your human reasoning, that is... uh, beyond what you should be doing to wait until you hear God. That is one of the greatest forms of idolatry you can enter into. Because it's putting your ability above God. And really, that was it in a nutshell. So they took off what they had, which they had gotten from Egypt. And when they made it, it ended up looking like something they were familiar with in Egypt that would represent the presence of God. Now, that's the part I want you to understand. What most people don't understand about the uh, golden calf, it was actually the precursor to the ark. It was their form of creating the ark that they, they wanted an ark. They wanted God's presence. They wanted Moses leading them, so they created them it themselves. That is the issue we get in our worship with church. We want to worship the way we want to worship. It's no different than Cain. Then you have this moving on. I don't want to go to that church. I don't like that. Well, I come here every Sunday morning thinking, let's have a clean slate and let's see what God wants to do. See, now I want you to understand that. I'm not coming here. We, we try to plan. The plans of man, uh, man are okay as long as you let God interrupt them. And what, what we want to understand this month is the things that we're not waiting for God to form to give us direction for the future, that's the things we want to deal with. So, Father, I'm going to ask you right now, as we move forward and as we understand this dimension of idolatry, that this month you show us some things linked with our walk, that we know you want to change. And Lord, if you will do that, then Father, we submit to change them. And Father, we wait for your word. This morning I got up at five and I said, Lord, you've got to give me the prayer for those that you've given me. I didn't get that till 6.48. You see what I mean? You have to wait to get the prayer, the word. And the only way you can get there is through worship. You can't get there any other way. So, Father, I'm going to thank you that we're not just going to take this as some good religious message that we've heard about on idolatry. 
We say, let us learn. In other words, if you jump out and dance just the way you danced last week, just because we're supposed to dance, you're already opening a door for this. And so, Father, we ask you right now to move us in a new way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a break. We'll be back in here at 9 o'clock.